today, we are just in week four of our series all about friendship, and we have been diving in to what biblical friendship truly looks like, and we've been gaining this deeper understanding of how Jesus has designed friendship for us and the implications of that as we bring all of our friendships, all of our relationships under his lordship. The triune nature of God is the perfect example that we can look to of a friendship, of a deep friendship with one another. And so as he's called us into friendship with himself, he's also called us into friendship with one another. And his good plan for each one of our lives is that we would experience the rich, rewarding, fulfilling friendships that he has created us for. And in a period of time when people are experiencing more loneliness on an ongoing basis, the need has never been greater to understand God's design for friendships so that we experience richer relationships. But it's not just for us, that we might carry a heart for other people to experience rich relationships as well. If loneliness is an epidemic, what contributes to that? Why are we experiencing it at record numbers? Well, loneliness, it just doesn't relegate itself to proximity, right? Sure, isolation is a major factor. No, we can be surrounded by people every single day, moment by moment, and still carry such a deep sense of loneliness. Why is that? Well, I would argue that one of the greatest threats to friendship, to the breakdown of friendship, is offense. There is nothing more divisive, there's nothing more isolating than carrying a deep wound, a deep hurt of offense. Oh yes, on the outside perhaps everything can look pristine in your world, but on the inside you're just creating this narrative that's playing over and over and over again in your head, perhaps filling in the gaps of assumptions and carrying deep wounds along the way. My goodness, offense is sneaky like that. At first, you can kind of get away with covering it up. Well, after it's been left unaddressed for a little while, and it doesn't take long, you can be sure that it will begin to spill out in your behaviors, in your attitudes, in your rhetoric, in everything that you do. It will begin to spill out of you. And you will ultimately isolate yourself and your heart from other people. It is an obstacle that we trip up again, time and time again, and that causes us to further isolate if we don't address it. See, oh, I'm offended, has become this all-encompassing phrase we like to throw out at the drop of a hat. It's like this badge of honor almost that we've actually picked up so we can proudly tout around all the major and minor ways that we can show everyone the ways that we've been wronged. We even have this tendency of making light of it. You know, you know the one. Oh, I'm so offended by that, but we joke about it to this, that, and the other, it's just become such a casual point in our society. It's been so casually adopted into our language. And I think that this casual nature to it has actually caused us to shift the way that we carry offense. It's actually caused us to carve out a distinct place in who we are. You know, if we're not careful, we move from just feeling offense to being offense. We carry around this offended nature, and everywhere that we go, we're that offended person. It becomes who we are, innate. It's just who I am, you know? Wow, we've allowed this vocabulary to infiltrate our lives. A loose rebuttal to this or a remark made out of deep hurt to that, they begin to well up out of us. And with more and more haste with each one, we try to outrun it just to prove a point. It starts off small, but the nature of unaddressed offense, it picks up speed with each passing moment. You know, we're just kind of going down on our little tracks, speeding down the race, but oh, we're just going to pick up that fence, throw it in the caboose. Going to pick up that one too, throw it back in the caboose. Ooh, ouch, that one hurt. Let me just grab a hold of it, throw it in. Oh, hang about, I didn't get invited to that. Ooh, that looks good, I'll grab that one too. It's like a tiny rock in our shoe. You know, at first it's just like merely an annoyance, it's irritating, but as more and more repeated pressure is applied to that tiny rock, it starts to make an indent, and it starts to cause true pain. And that's why offense is an obstacle. The Greek translation for the word offense is scandalon, meaning that it is a stick for bait of trap, generally a snare or a stumbling block. It creates a chasm between our hearts being tethered together. 
It makes a mountain out of a rock. It lures us in with the fleeting feeling of justification for just a moment, but it will cause us to trip up every single time. And not only is an offense an obstacle for us, but it actually creates an obstacle between us as friends. You know, if any of you were around in um, church in the early to mid-2000s, there was kind of this, like, ongoing mentality of just, just be unoffendable, bro. And, like, I tried to pick that up. I definitely touted it in coffees with people. I was like, yeah, just be unoffendable. But if I were to be really honest, that was a really hard thing for me to try to reconcile. I couldn't just figure out how people just let things slip off their back, how nothing could get deep enough to wound them. And I actually started to carry a sense of guilt as a result of it because I'm like, how do I do this? How do I become an unoffendable person? Well, gosh, I'm just carrying guilt now because I'm doing both. And now I'm just, I'm just like in this prison of guilt, but also offense. You know what I mean? And so it's both impractical and improbable that we will never be affected by a wound resulting in offense, especially when those wounds are caused by a good friend, someone that we have built our lives with. See, the closer that we get to one another, the deeper we can be wounded by one another. Wives, I know you know what I'm talking about. We know our husbands the best. We know all of their shortcomings. We know all of their greatest attributes. We know their desires, their dreams, their fears, their insecurities. And so if we know them the best, that means that we can cut them the best. You know, in an argument where we can just point out that insecurity, we can cut the legs right out from underneath them. We have that same propensity in our good friendship. The deeper our relationships go, the risk of a deep wound to one another increases whether intentionally or unintentionally. But high risk means high reward because at the same time, the deeper our relationships go, the greater the opportunity for us to believe the best about one another should increase all the more. So at this point, we can just take a deep breath because none of us are immune. We are not immune to being offended and we're certainly not immune to offending. We are all humans, after all, living with a sinful nature, which means that we're all going to trip up sometimes. So my goal is not to just say, oh, in order to be in a rich, fulfilling relationship with one another, we just got to be unoffendable. No, my hope is to help us uncover why dealing with offense is so valuable, how addressing those areas actually contribute to the richness of relationship with others so that we can practically walk this out together. See, if we desire to experience healthy, strong, fruitful friendships that God has designed for us, then we must endeavor to view the friendship through his lens and allow the truth of his word shape and cultivate the way that we respond in a moment of hurt and pain. The strength and beauty of our friendships will be measured by the fires that we walk through together and our ability to remain committed to one another despite the hardships that arise. Scott McKnight sums it up like this. He says, friendship in the biblical mode is like this. All things will be reconciled and we are summoned to begin living in that reconciliation now. We have been summoned to live in reconciliation because we have been reconciled back to the Father and he has reconciled us back to one another. This means that we need to consider how we are approaching friendships here and now. And to truly grasp this, we must view everything with heaven in mind. Do we consider our friendships temporal and shallow? Just simply a convenient and a fun hang, but when the going gets tough, the tough gets going? Or do we view our friendships with heaven in mind, valuing longevity, climbing to mountaintops together, journeying through valleys with one another, and pursuing reconciliation in all things? We must shift our perspective from simply looking at the gap that the offense has created and rather looking to build a bridge so we can walk together in unity. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, he says, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
Pursuing reconciliation now means that we pick up the calling that Jesus has called us to. It means that we are bearing with one another and we are eager to maintain unity. And reconciliation is necessary because offenses will come, like I said moments ago, none of us are immune. But when we value our friendships this way, it causes us to adjust what we linger on and how we respond when those things come. If we took this moment, notion of viewing our friendships with heaven in mind, how would that reframe the way that we encourage one another? Or endeavor to sharpen them with the truth of God's word because we truly love them and want to see them grow? Or how can we look for ways to serve them? How would it change our speech about them? Or the ways that we characterize how we respond when things get rocky? Living in reconciliation now means that we value the truth and we value sharpening. We need to stop getting offended at our friends, our leaders, or our pastors when we've actually given them a door into speaking into our worlds, but oh, that truth doesn't align with my comfort, so you wouldn't possibly understand, so I'm just going to carry this offense now and actually not bring anything to you in the future. We have to stop that. We have to value truth, and we have to value sharpening. Living in reconciliation also means that we seek ways to move towards unity rather than to committing to our truth, which will just inevitably offend someone else. In other words, let's stop being offensive people. Like, let's always be drawing towards unity. The only truth that we should be living out and pointing people towards is the truth. And that's going to characterize the way that we respond to things. You know those friends that always start out the sentence, no offense, but... Yeah, we got to stop being those people. We got to stop being the people who strive to tear one another down for the sake of being honest. No, let's strive to speak truth and love so that we can build one another up in unity. Without the revelation of reconciliation, we will live short-sighted and never value the relationship enough to properly deal with the hard stuff that comes our way. Untended to offense will only produce ugly roots of bitterness that they will spring forth in our hearts. And offense you carry in one relationship, oh, that will necessarily spill out into all of the other relationships. That insecurity that's produced, oh, that'll definitely spill out into all of your other friendships. The root of bitterness is so dangerous, and we have to deal with it before it gets too far gone. It's called a root for a reason. You actually have to pull it out. You can't just chop off a vegetation and hope that it doesn't spring up. You actually have to excavate the whole root system. See, roots are what get buried deep within the soil, and they provide nutrients and hydration to a plant so that it can thrive. And if we expose a cut-back plant to the sun, it doesn't matter how long, as long as the root system is in place, it'll keep springing up. It'll keep popping up and trying to produce something. The same goes for the fruit of offense. We allow the light of Jesus into the symptom, whatever is above the surface, and we're like, we're going to deal with this. Oh, I let Jesus in. Oh, thank goodness. Done with that. But have we allowed him in to the places, the dark places of the soil of our heart, to the root system, to get to the root of the matter, to let him fully excavate that out? Because otherwise, we're going to deal with the symptom, and we're never going to deal with the problem. Hebrews 12, 15 says, watch over, other, watch over each other to make sure that no one misses the revelation of God's grace and make sure no one lives with a root of bitterness sprouting within them, which only will cause trouble and poison to the hearts of many. A bitter root produces bitter fruit, and those who eat of it, it's, Hebrews likens it to poison. It only produces trouble and it poisons. You know bitter things. It has a bitter taste. You need something to cleanse your palate afterwards. It's unsatisfying. There's nothing great about something bitter except for radicchio. That's pretty good. But people don't want to keep tasting bitter fruit. They don't want to keep tasting that bitter word that you're sowing into their world. So we have to do the hard work and excavate it. If living in reconciliation now is the goal for our friendships, Well, then how do we deal with them when they come our way so that we can protect what is taking root in our heart and we can overcome the obstacles that try to pry its way between us? Well, we bring it to the right source and we respond in the right way. 
we can choose to either allow it to cause further separation or we can allow it to cause us to move towards unity with God and with one another. Are we bringing it to the right source? Do we let it fester or is our first response to bring it to Jesus? So often our propensity is to hold on to the offense, like grip it so tight for as long as possible, letting it fester and develop this narrative all on its own. You know, a small spark exposed to oxygen, well, it just needs live or dry vegetation to actually start to smolder. And once it starts smoldering, it's not long before a full-blown wildfire breaks out, causing devastation to everything that it touches. We believe the lie that holding on to the hurt is justified and that the feelings associated and produced, they're validated. But just like a fire, each mounting thought associated with the hurt builds upon itself, clearing the way for deeper hurt, anger, and isolation, and causes devastation to everyone that we encounter. When we do this, we make an idol out of offense. It becomes our sole focus. It warps our perspective. It robs us of our peace. And it doesn't give us much hope for healing. The idol of offense, it'll trick us into a false sense of comfort. And if we value that comfort over the growth that God has for us, well, we will continue to get tripped up every single time. Living in reconciliation must be fueled by love. God reconciled us back to himself through his son because of his great love for us, and he has commanded us to love one another. So we have to ask ourselves, if we're carrying an offense, how am I loving my brother and sister in that moment? Love should be our motivation in all things. It is the antidote to bitterness, and that is the result that it is the antidote to bitterness that is the result of what we have allowed to fester for far too long. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's own achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame or disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. You know, it's no small task to love in the way that we're called to love. I mean, this does not, does this not sound daunting? Like, how are we supposed to do this in all things? Sometimes it feels very impossible But however difficult it may seem, we must carry this posture. And the best way that we can do that is letting our first response be to go to Jesus. Because if Jesus is Lord of our lives, that means that he's Lord of our friendships too. And he's the greatest friend that we'll ever have. This means that we go to him first to process rather than just setting it aside on a plate and hoping that it won't actually pop up somewhere. And beyond that, we must go to... Go to him first before we go to others. Only in his presence can we bring our full selves, the pain, the insecurity, the disappointment, the anger. We can bring this all to him so that we can process correctly. We must also continually point our friends to Jesus before attempting to process with us. If we carry the revelation of the necessity to go to Jesus first, then we also must point our friends back to him. Ask the question, what has God been talking to you about that? If they don't have a response, well, before they take another word, you better point them back to Jesus. Tell them to spend some time in prayer and come back to you when they've actually been able to process and excavate the thing. Because this cannot be conditional. This can't be conditional for ourselves But because we would rather try to be a savior for someone? Oh, no. We have to point them to the one and true savior every time. Allowing him into the situation helps us discern if we need to self-reflect. It enables us to reframe our perspective, take stock of the different assumptions that we've pulled into that. Perhaps we've put an assumption of intent behind a text or a tone. Or perhaps we've allowed others, what other people have said, to skew our perspective and carry something that we were never intended to carry? Did I fill in the gap of of intention in anything? 
What part have I played in letting it sting so bad? What is the condition of my heart, and have I stewarded it well, or have I created a place where uh, disappointment and offense are just ready to take root? When we allow the light of heaven into the way that we process, we actually get to break off the chains of offense and actually step into the freedom that Jesus promises. And you know what else? Inviting Jesus into our pain, inviting Jesus into our processing helps us be okay with not getting an apology to be okay. How good is that? My goodness, the Bible says that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. So no matter who is to blame, we have an individual responsibility to come to him and to get good with God. And he has given us the beautiful gift of repentance to do that. The Holy Spirit partners with us to identify and illuminate the areas in our hearts that we have allowed to get hard. He helps us uproot those bad roots of bitterness, and he gives us the strength to believe all things, to remain faithful through the trials, and to point us back to the truth. Another thing that we have the opportunity to do when we go to Jesus first is we have the opportunity to lament with him. He is near to the brokenhearted, and he is near to the crushed in spirit. He will never leave us or forsake us. The deep wounds and grief that we do carry because things sting and things do hurt, he wants us to bring them to his feet. And he promises that in his presence, he will bring healing and restoration. He will bring peace and comfort in those moments. But I think so often, we forget that we can actually come to him with those things. We don't actually bring our lament to him because either we're not validating our pain or think that he's validating it, or we don't think that he wants to be invited into it. But lamenting is a gift that he has given us, and it is essential for our processing the offense and moving beyond it. Only Jesus can provide the clarity and peace that we need so that we might take the best next step with wisdom. It's in his presence that we find everything that we need to purify our hearts and renew our love for one another. So after we've gone to the right source, we must then discern what the right approach is. Oftentimes, getting good with God is truly one of the only steps we have to take. That's how freeing it can be to remove an offense in our world. But there are also times where we need to address the person directly. And spending time with him helps us discern those moments, and it also helps soften our hearts for those moments. This can be really uncomfortable if we're not good with confrontation. But if our motivation is love, then learning how to have healthy dialogue with one another it's essential for the relationship to thrive and move forward. Hear me when I say one another. I mean you and the offender. I don't mean you, that person, that person, in or outside of your friend group, because that is just called gossip. There is nothing healing about gossip, and there is nothing that fans offense into flame like gossip does. Oh, I just need to process with someone. Well, you won't believe what so-and-so said to me or looked at me like. Or perhaps it's a little less direct, chiming in every time you hear their name, lambasting their character, or discussing all the areas that they need to grow as a Christianese, like cop-out. Oh, however it comes out, gossip is gossip, and it is never honoring, and it is never motivated by love. But so often, this is how we fan it to flame in our life. Proverbs 17.9 says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Proverbs 16.28 says, A twisted person spreads rumors. A whispering gossip ruins good friendships. What do we learn from this wisdom? That covering one another leads us to unity, but gossip will always separate us. And Proverbs 6 give us, gives us a pretty clear picture of what God thinks about gossip. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. My goodness, three out of seven of those things are all pertaining to gossip, so we should probably take this to heart and understand that God's heart is not for us to be separating friends and gossiping about one another. 
not only does gossip keep you stuck in your offense, because rehashing it over and over again, that's not helping you process. It's actually just spreading a wildfire. But it also sowed seed of discord to those who participate in it. Friends, our first response when someone comes to us with a juicy piece of gossip should be to shut it down. Oh, and if you're just overhearing the conversation, we should love one another enough, love the individual that's being talked about, love our brothers and sisters who are stepping out to gossip. We should love them enough to shut it down. Even if we are just overhearers to a conversation, we are just as much a part of it. And if we give a listening ear in our, in the, in our position in the conversation, it's going to be just as damaging to us who are listening as to the one who is sowing the discord in the first place. Slowly, those who are giving a listening ear, well, maybe they weren't carrying the, that attitude beforehand, but surely they will start to carry that attitude about the individual. They will necessarily take on the perspective of the gossiping individual. Your frame of reference is reshaped, and you begin holding on to those wrong thought patterns. You're not even the one carrying the offense, but oh, like I said, offense has become so casual to us that we actually just pick up offense for one another on one another's behalves. I mean, my goodness, how dare we allow our brothers and sisters to be tripped up by putting an obstacle in their way because we don't have the discipline to tame our tongues. Oh, and can I also just add, please don't get offended if someone comes to shut down like a gossiping party. Don't get offended at that. Don't get offended at them because it's all for our benefit. Proverbs 2019 says, a blabbermouth will reveal your secrets. So stay away from people who can't keep their mouth shut. Just stay away from them. I love that. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear it. Can we be a community of friends who endeavor to cover one another rather than uncover and separate? Can we be characterized by speech that builds one another up, believes the best, and is laced with grace? So then, what are the rules of engagement for community? How do we appropriately respond when offense comes? Well, number one, we talked about it. We don't gossip about it. And hear me, we're not immune to that. Things are going to come up. Things are going to pop up. We're all going to slip and stumble in that area because we all are enticed by it. So to hear my heart, it's not about that. It's having a heart of love and being fueled by motivation so that we can actually curb those things and help that, if it's a habit in our lives, help curb that and help us go to Jesus first and repent in those moments. But Matthew 18 gives us a model for how we can approach an issue with one another. I'm not going to go through it. There's a lot of different, like, steps and wisdom that we can pull from it. But the first thing is to begin is that it says, discuss between the two of you alone. And like I said, that's why it's so important for us to go to God first, because it prepares our hearts in humility to have an honest conversation, but with the end goal of reconciliation. If we go into all hard conversations with the, with the end goal of reconciliation, with the end goal of unity, with the end goal that it's going to turn out all right, it's going to frame the way that we actually have the conversation so that it actually has a good outcome. You know, there are some times where it is appropriate to bring in a leader or a pastor. Sometimes we need help and guidance of like, how should I approach this? Or am I thinking about this the right way? Or help me see a blind spot. Help me reframe this so I'm seeing this in love and not in hatred. But also, don't go to them and not expect them to actually challenge you to make sure that you're going to have a dialogue with that person to challenge that thought pattern. I'll probably circle back and ask how the conversation went. We're here to help each other grow. Oh, and also don't be going to your friends under the guise of seeking advice, but knowing that that person is definitely not going to challenge you. Don't be doing that either. Although we cannot avoid the daggers that come our way, God in all of his redemptive nature will work it together. If we yield to his instruction and to his wisdom, when we actively choose to pursue building a bridge over the obstacle of offense, we're able to move towards unity with God and it only adds value to our relationship. There's so much beauty unlocked 
when we believe all things, when we never give up, and we continually point each other back to the truth. And I keep coming back to that because that is essential for our motivation in overcoming offense because the truth is we need each other. We need the refining moments that offense actually carve out in us if we allow the Holy Spirit to work within us. Friendships are absolutely necessary for our own sanctification. We need those hard friction moments. We need that offense to actually carve out a space for us to learn a deeper revelation of God's grace towards us, but also how to repair things with one another. To quote Scott McKnight even further, he continues, friendship is about effective, rugged commitment, about presence and advocacy, and it is about growing in Christoformity. Viewing friendships with heaven in mind causes us to commit to one another with longevity in mind. It causes us to be present with one another, to take action on one another's behalf, but most importantly, it causes us to grow in Christ alongside one another. We should be sharpening one another. We should be challenging one another. We should be growing in maturity with one another. When we choose to cut ourselves off from that friend due to that challenging conversation or the the unrelenting offense, we are actually cutting ourselves short from our faith journey to grow in steadfastness. And the longer we remain in our offenses, the longer we remain in immaturity. Hebrews 5 talks about that, that someone that doesn't even understand the basic principles of God, they need to remain on milk. They can't take solid food yet, but the mature person can take solid food. We need to make sure that we are maturing and we don't pull away from those challenging friendships because when we do, we actually establish this unspoken distance between ourselves and the friendships that bring challenge. We remain in comfort And sometimes this isn't always overt, like having a major falling out, and we know that there's definitely a disconnection between those two people. Oh no, this can show up in other subtle ways, like perhaps who you're calling when you're making a major life decision or a relationship decision or helping get discernment on a direction you feel God is leading you to. Is that me or is that really the Holy Spirit leading me? We we change who we're going to. We create an unspoken distance. Or maybe we create space in our hearts that that person once filled, but we're filling it with work, hobbies, Netflix, so that we appear to be busy rather than just avoiding. We lose out on maturity, and we need to make sure that we're not cutting others short from their maturity by us not maturing because we are all members of the same body, brothers and sisters reconciled to one another. So when I commit to maturing, and you commit to maturing, we all get to grow together. Reconciliation is the goal, my friends. Offense and hurt will come. They will sting and they will jolt you. But when we tend to them, when we fight for friendship over the offense, when we choose to approach friendships with heaven in mind, we find that those friendships are the most fulfilling of all. The longevity attached to a faithful friend can't be matched. So let's not let the offense have the last word in our friendships. Let's endeavor to remove the obstacle so that each of us are strengthened to go the distance. Amen.